It is so good to see you all here or to know that you're listening and watching and worshiping with us today. This is the fifth Sunday that we've been on this unique schedule away from the sanctuary worshiping, uh, but it is still worship. Uh, last night while I was listening to our pastor do his Wednesday night study uh, from the book of Zechariah, I sat out by myself on our deck at a beautiful fire, and I told him later that he actually uh, was good competition for my fire. I watched the fire and listened to our pastor, but this is uh, our Sunday worship time. We start with an old hymn that talks about worship. Brethren, we have met to worship. It's a good hymn. and come and pray with us and for us. Good morning. I'm going to read for you now from Paul's letter to the Colossians. In chapter 1, I'll begin in the middle part of verse 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you 
since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints and light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Let's pray. Our Father, We seek to worship you this morning. And I know that now for several weeks it's not in the way that we're accustomed to doing it as a church. But I pray in this way and in these attempts that you would help us to do that individually. And that you would help us to do that as we gather together as families or in other units. And just in it all, Father, our prayer is that you would sense in us and see in us hearts and minds that are set aside during this time to focus on you and to think about what you've done for us through Jesus and to think about what you teach us about yourself and your wonderful salvation and the gospel in your word. And I pray, Father, that you would find in us during this time hearts that long to ascribe to you the worth, the worship that you deserve. So help us, Father, towards that end as we're living in these strange times, these different times, and times that are so different for us in terms of what it means to be a church and what it means to have church and what it means to worship together. So we pray for your great grace and your great mercy this day. We thank you, Father, for what you've given to us in Jesus. We celebrate him. We want to lift high his name, and we pray as we do that you would draw people to him. And I pray now for those that are sick. I pray for those that are mourning. I pray for those that are dealing with other things. You know what they need better than I do and better than we do. And better than even those in need do. And so we ask, Father, that you would help them and heal them and work in their lives. Especially we continue to pray for what's going on with the coronavirus, that you would give our leaders wisdom and that you would give those who are directly involved in working with it not only wisdom but strength and power and that you would protect them. We pray, Father, for healing for those that have it and comfort for those that are dealing with the difficulty of one having it or having had it. And we just pray, Father, that in this all that you would draw us closer together and especially that you would draw us unto yourself. We pray that you would use it to awaken hearts and minds to their need for Christ. And again, we pray that through your word this morning, that you would show us Christ and that you would reveal yourself in Him. And Father, that we would see Him clearly, see you clearly, and give you the praise and the glory and worship that you deserve. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. When the music fades and all is swept away and I simply come longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself It's not what you have required. It's the 
much, much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it, but it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. King of endless world. How much you deserve. Though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours. Every single breath. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search the I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it, when it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper with the way things appear, you're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it, when it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you. It's all about you. my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Thank you. 
this time, I would usually tell you to turn in your Bible somewhere in the book of 1 John, but I'm going to take another week off from it. Last week was for an Easter message. Today is to address something that I was first going to do as a Facebook post, but as I kept running it around in my mind, I quickly realized that it was going to be far too long for Facebook and would be much better as a sermon. I'll introduce it to you in the form of a question. And that question is, does the Bible guarantee us protection and deliverance from the coronavirus? Now, I could have said, does the Bible guarantee us protection and or deliverance from sickness, from problems, from trouble, from trials, from tribulation, because what I'm going to say will cover all of those things, but I'm asking specifically about the coronavirus because it is on everyone's mind and because it's what so many people are using the Bible to speak to and to speak about. I've been thinking for weeks now about how to respond to so much of what I've heard and seen. I I think that I need to. I feel compelled to. I feel that I have an obligation to. So, here I go. My answer is no. The Bible does not guarantee us protection and deliverance from the coronavirus. At least, no, not in the way people most naturally understand that question. And no, not in the way that many people are saying that it does. I realize that by answering no, that it's going to make me unpopular and that it places me in the minority, perhaps even on the opposite side of you. But I'm going to argue the biblical case for my answer, and I ask that you hear me out. Even more, I ask that you hear God out, that you hear all that He has to say on the subject in His Word, the Bible, as opposed to hearing merely a verse or a few verses. I want you to hear what God says about this and related subjects in its context rather than removed from its context and rather than with no consideration of its context. A couple of weeks ago, I got the following text from a church member. It said, how are we to understand and apply verses like Exodus 12, 13, 2 Samuel 24, and Psalm 91 with COVID-19. The whole counsel of the Word does not indicate that Christians are immune from death by tragedy, does it? Well, this church member was heading in the right direction. No, the Bible does not indicate that Christians are immune from tragedy. But this brother asked the question in that text because like myself, and I'm sure like you, he had been hearing and seeing things from Christians who said that it did. Them quoting these texts and others as guarantees that 
we would be spared or healed from coronavirus, that we will be spared or healed from the coronavirus, that we can be spared or healed from the coronavirus. So I'm going to begin my argument that the Bible doesn't guarantee this with some of these texts. First, there's Exodus chapter 12, verse 13. If you have your Bible, you can turn there. Now, in that verse, here's what we read. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This is a verse from the very first Passover with the tenth plague against the Egyptians. God was killing all of the firstborn sons in the land, but He would pass over or spare the Israelites who sacrificed a special lamb and spread its blood over their homes. This verse is used in our current situation as either a proof that we are or a way that we can be spared from this plague. Either because the blood of Jesus has been applied to us, the coronavirus will pass over us, or if we apply the blood of Jesus in some way, the coronavirus will pass over us. I've seen pictures of some who have painted their doors red or tied something red to their homes as a means of protection. Then there's 2 Samuel chapter 24. You can turn there. I'm going to begin to read there in verse 10. 2 Samuel 24 beginning in verse 10. It says, But David's heart struck him after he had numbered or taken a census of the people. And David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. But now, O Lord, please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. And when David arose in the morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and say to David, Thus says the Lord, Three things I offer you. Choose one of them that I may do it to you. So Gad came to David and told him and said to him, Shall three years of famine come to you in your land? Or will you flee three months before your foes while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days pestilence in your land? Now consider and decide one answer. I shall return to him who sent me. Then David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercy is great. But let me not fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent a pestilence on Israel from the morning until the appointed time. And there died of the people from Dan to Beersheba 70,000 men. And when the angel stretched out his hand toward Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented from the calamity and said to the angel who was working destruction among the people, It is enough. Now stay your hand. And the angel of the Lord was standing by the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. Then David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking the people and said, Behold, I have sinned. And I have done wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? Please let your hand be against me and against my father's house. And Gad came that day to David and said to him, Go up, raise an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. So David went up at Gad's word as the Lord commanded. And when Aruna looked down, he saw the king and his servants coming on toward him. And Aruna went out and paid homage to the king with his face to the ground. And Aruna said, Why has my lord the king come to his servant? David said, To buy the threshing floor from you in order to build an altar to the Lord that the plague may be averted from the people. Then Aruna said to David, 
Let my lord the king take and offer up what seems good to him. Here are the oxen for the burnt offering and the threshing sledges and the yokes of the oxen for the wood. All of this, O king, Aruna gives to the king. And Aruna said to the king, May the Lord your God accept you. But the king said to Aruna, No, but I will buy it from you for a price. I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. And David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord responded to the plea for the land, and the plague was averted from Israel. Now, when this story is applied to the coronavirus, the solution is to offer a sacrifice to God so that He will stop this punishment for our sin. As to what the acceptable sacrifice is, it varies depending on who you hear this verse used by or this passage used by. Some suggest the acceptable sacrifice is sincerity, others contrition, others repentance, others prayer, others commitment or recommitment, others service or unity or an offering or faith. Whatever they suggest that the acceptable sacrifice is, it's about finding the right amount, the required level of it. And if we do, it, the coronavirus, will be over. Now the next passage is the 91st Psalm. Turn there with me if you would. It's a wonderful psalm, a well-known psalm, Psalm 91. One. Here's what it says. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. For He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His pinions and under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand even at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. For He will command His angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. This psalm is used as evidence that while the world is subject to the coronavirus, Christians are not, or Christians don't have to be. It's about faith, whether you have it or not, whether you have enough of it or not. Those who cite the 91st Psalm see it as a rock-solid guarantee against this evil that we're facing and every other evil. They see Christians, because of a passage like this and others, as invincible, as overcomers, as chain-breakers, no matter the opponent, no matter the obstacle, no matter the type of chains. If Christians don't overcome... It's because the Christian has failed in some way. Because in every circumstance, according to these people, God has promised us healing and well-being. 
I'll mention one more passage. And I do because I'm convinced that it's the one that I've seen referenced the most in these last few weeks or the last month or so. In fact, I saw it last night. And thinking about it, I think I've seen it at least once or heard it at least once every day throughout the whole time that this has been going on. And that passage is Second Chronicles chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. I would ask you to turn there. You certainly can, but I think you know it as well as I do. It says, When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people. If my people who were called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. These words were spoken by God to Solomon when the temple was being dedicated. God said about the temple that it would be a house of prayer and that He would hear the prayers that were offered there, specifically those in which Israel confessed their sins which had brought upon themselves the judgment of God. And therefore, in response to these prayers where they confessed their sins, God would bring an end to His judgment, to His punishment, to His curse that He had enacted against them. So this text, when it's cited in regards to the coronavirus, is presented as a promised fix for it or a promised end to it. The idea being, if Christians will really repent and really pray, God will take it away. Well, these aren't the only passages like this in the Bible. And they aren't the only ones that I've heard mentioned. But these are representative of what the others say. So I think you get the point from the four that I've used. And maybe you think the point is that I've missed the point completely. Because these passages seem to give an answer of yes to the question that I've asked. So maybe you think my case for the answer being no is an unmakeable case. But I don't think so. Here's why. What do all those passages have in common beyond their subject matter? I'll ask you like this. What do these Scripture references have in common? Listen to them again, the Scripture references. Exodus 12, 2 Samuel 24, 2 Chronicles 7, Psalm 91. What do those Scripture references all have in common? They're from the Old Testament. Now that doesn't mean that they're meaningless for us or that they don't apply, but it does mean something. Something that we must consider before we race to making application from them. What does the Old Testament mean? Well, it means Old Covenant. And this is what we must take into consideration. Because Christians, the church do not relate to God through the Old Covenant. We are not under it. But before I talk about that and what it means, I want to make sure that you have a basic understanding of this subject, covenant. A covenant is an agreement, a contract, a promise. It's a binding relationship which includes terms as a part of it. And a covenant is between two parties. In this case, the two parties were God and Israel. The old covenant was the binding relationship between Him and them. And the old covenant 
is the most well-known of a number of covenants that we find in the Old Testament. It's sometimes called the covenant of the law. The law being a reference to the Ten Commandments which were given by God to Moses, to His people there on Mount Sinai. For that reason, it's sometimes called the Sinai Covenant. This covenant, the Old Covenant, the covenant of the law, the Ten Commandments, was a conditional covenant. And I'll tell you what conditional means. God would bless Israel with life, health, wealth, success in every area of life, land, protection, and peace, if Israel kept His law, if they obeyed His commandments. But if Israel did not keep God's law, if they disobeyed God's commandments, God would curse them with Sickness, death, loss, poverty, failure, war, oppression, captivity. He would curse them by taking their land away or by taking them away from their land. That is the context and therefore the meaning of passages like Second Samuel 24, Second Chronicles 7, Psalm 91. And while the Passover passage in Exodus chapter 12 does come just before the institution of the Old Covenant in Exodus chapter 20, its promises of physical life and health were made to a specific people, Israel, in a specific situation at a specific time. It does have application to us, but as we'll see later, that application isn't literal and it isn't physical at this time. As for the Old Covenant, why do we call it old? Well, because it has been fulfilled and therefore replaced by a new covenant which is pictured and prophesied in the Old Testament and which is then revealed and explained in the New Testament. Does that mean that there was something wrong with the Old Covenant? Does that then mean that there is something wrong with God's law or God's commandments? No, there's nothing wrong with God and therefore there's nothing wrong with the law that He gave, the commandments that He sent forth. Paul put it this way in Romans chapter 7, verse 7. What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. And then later on in that same chapter, verse 12, he said the law is holy and the command is holy and righteous and good. But there was something wrong with the other party in the Old Covenant. There was something wrong with Israel, the people. They did not keep God's law. They did not obey God's commands. And what's worse than they did not do it, they could not do it. So they weren't able to keep God's blessings. And they received instead His curses or His judgment. But it's not just them. There's something wrong with all people. There's something wrong with every person. There's something wrong with us. There's something wrong with me. And there's something wrong with you. We don't keep God's law. We don't obey God's commands. We can't. None of us. All of us are incapable of doing so. All of us are guilty and therefore under the curse of God. We are guilty in Adam 
who represented all of us when He was the first man made, and therefore when He sinned, we sinned. When He became guilty, we became guilty. When He died, we died in Him, the Scripture says. But we're also guilty in our own sin. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then earlier in Romans 3, verse 10, Paul wrote there, There is none that is good, or there is none that is righteous. No, not one. Which means that no one is able to earn the blessing or the blessings of God. We can't do anything or live in such a way that would guarantee us the blessings of the Old Covenant, including protection and or deliverance from the coronavirus. Remember, under the Old Covenant, people are obligated to keep all of the law, all of the commands of God. That's the condition that must be met to guarantee the blessings. Paul put it this way in Galatians 5. You who would be justified by the law are obligated to keep the whole law. In Exodus chapter 19, verse 8, we read about God talking about the stipulations or the conditions of the old covenant with Israel before Exodus 20 records the giving of the Ten Commandments. And there in Exodus 19, 8, here's what we read. All the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Disobedience in even one area of the law or to just one commandment makes one a lawbreaker, a sinner, and disqualifies him or her or them from the blessing of God. It places him or her or them under the curse. Galatians 3.10 says, All who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, here's the curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. That's the curse of the law. That if you're attempting to get to God by keeping His rules, you're under a curse because you have to keep it all and you haven't. And you don't. And you can't. If you are trying to do anything... To guarantee the blessings of God, you are far, far apart from God. What you are practicing is work salvation. To think that there is something we can do to ensure God will do some good thing for us or keep or take some bad thing away from us is the height of spiritual arrogance. It's the height of religious pride. And these things are the very things that God throughout His Word hates the most. It's a total misunderstanding and misuse of Scripture at best and a heretical abuse of Scripture at worst. That brings me to something that's been on my mind for a long time. A major mistake even well-intentioned Christians make in reading and applying and teaching the Bible is failing to distinguish between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. I've made that mistake repeatedly. I've made that mistake as a pastor, especially in earlier years of my being a pastor. And even now, I still have to be very careful not to make that mistake. 
It especially comes out in our handling of Old Old Testament text like the ones I've used today. We call ourselves New Testament churches and New Testament Christians while we operate many times like we're under the Old Covenant. The failure to distinguish between the two explains the misuse of the Bible during the coronavirus and other big societal issues. And worse than that, this failure to distinguish between the two is a weakness that the heresy of the name it and claim it, health and wealth, prosperity gospel, or the word of faith movement, if you want to call it that, this failure to distinguish between the two is a weakness that that heresy takes advantage of and abuses, even as it abuses God's Word. By the way, where have all those types been the last couple of months? I'll tell you where they've been. They've been being exposed for the frauds that they are. Christian, we are not under the old covenant. It is not the way we relate to God. We are not under the demands or the curses of the law, and we are not guaranteed the blessings of it, at least not now. So, we must consider whether what we are reading and studying in the Old Testament is Old Covenant or not before we start applying it. As we do, we should praise the Lord that we aren't under the Old Covenant. Because if we were, we would still be apart from God and His blessing. And we would be that way forever Because there would be absolutely nothing we could do to get to God or to merit His blessing. We, Christians, the people of God, we are connected to, we are related to God by a new covenant. Hebrews chapter 8 says about it, it is a better covenant because it has better promises. That word promises is significant. Our relationship to God, this new covenant, is based on promises rather than on conditions, which is what the old covenant was based on. This covenant of promise was pointed to and prophesied in the Old Testament. Jeremiah 31 is an example. Ezekiel 36 is another example. Example. Genesis 15 is another example. In Genesis 15, which was centuries before the Old Covenant, God made a covenant with Abraham, and it was a covenant of promise. In this covenant, God said what He would do for Abraham with no mention at all of what Abraham had to do. There were no conditions in this covenant. It was an unconditional covenant. This is clear because in the ancient times, the way that a covenant was sealed, the ceremony that was enacted after it, was animals were sacrificed and cut in two so that the two parties of the covenant could walk between the cut in two sacrificed animals as a sign that this is going to happen to me if I break the covenant. Well, in this covenant that God made with Abraham, a similar ceremony took place. Sacrifices were made, the animals were split in two, but there was a difference. Only God made His way through the sacrifices. While Abraham was barely conscious off to the side. This indicated that God alone was responsible for carrying out this covenant. 
Abraham would receive the blessings that God had promised him through faith through believing what God said He would do for him earlier in Genesis 15, through believing the promises that God had made, he would not receive the blessings of this covenant through what he would do or through what he would not do. He would not receive the blessings of this covenant through living up to certain conditions. Genesis 15, 6 makes that clear. It says, Abram believed the Lord, and God credited it to him as righteousness. That's as important of a verse as there is in the Old Testament. I've always said so because it clearly teaches that Abraham was justified or saved through faith. And this is how every individual in the Old Testament that had a relationship with God was justified or saved. It wasn't through the old covenant. It was through this covenant. People have always been saved by grace through faith. People have always been saved by faith in the promises of God. They've never been saved by their works. They've never been saved by living up to conditions. Now, the nation of Israel was related to God by the old covenant. But remember... Not all Israel was Israel. Not every individual Israelite was a true Israelite. A true Jew, a true child of Abraham is not a matter of shared ethnicity, but one of shared faith. Paul said in Galatians 3, verses 7 through 9, "...it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham." The Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham. Did you hear that? God preached the gospel to Abraham, saying, In you shall all of the nations of the world be blessed, not by living up to certain conditions, but read on. Those who are of faith are blessed. With Abraham. Galatians 3.26 says, We are sons of God through faith. Faith in someone other than ourselves. Faith not only in the promises, plural of God, but in the promise of God. The seed, the Savior, the Messiah, the Christ. In the Old Testament, their faith looked forward to to the coming of the Messiah. And since the time of the New Testament, our faith has looked backward to when the Messiah came, but once it looks backward to what He's done, it then looks forward to the fact that He's coming again. Do you see the connection between the Abrahamic covenant and the new covenant? Do you see how the Abrahamic covenant pointed to and is fulfilled? in the new covenant, which is to say, do you see how the Abrahamic covenant is fulfilled in Christ? The promised seed, the promised Savior has come. And we receive the blessings of this covenant through faith in Him, through faith in who He is, through faith in what He has done through faith in Him as the promise of God and through faith in the promises that He makes. We receive these blessings through faith in Him because He, God in the flesh, is the one who has secured them. He alone was responsible for the keeping of this covenant. And He lived up to His responsibility. He earned the blessings that we now have through Him. The way He earned these blessings is through meeting the demands of the Old Covenant, the demands of the law. And remember, the demand of the law is perfect obedience. Well, Christ was perfectly obedient. He earned it through His righteousness. He also earned these blessings by taking on Himself the curse of the Old Covenant and the curse of the original law that God gave to Adam in the garden, the curse of 
breaking God's rules being death. The covenant was broken. So Christ our Savior took upon Himself the curse of becoming like the sacrifices by becoming the sacrifice. In the death of Jesus, He was punished for sins and sinners, fulfilling the demand of God's law for justice. God demonstrated in the cross, in the crucifixion of Christ, that He was just. And through the perfect life of Jesus, God justifies. He makes righteous because Christ has fulfilled the law's demand of complete righteousness, perfect obedience. The life and death of Christ are then counted, credited, imputed to those who repent and believe on Him as the blessing of God. As we believe, we can be assured that our sins were placed on Him and that His righteousness has been placed on us. This is the new covenant. And it is a better covenant because under it, as foreshadowed by the covenant with Abraham, the old covenant can be fulfilled. The conditions of the old covenant can be met by someone other than ourself. And the blessing of God can be possessed by faith and a promise rather than by meeting conditions. That's why you, if you have not, need to turn from your sin and trust on Jesus to save you, who He is and what He's done, because He is the only way to the blessing of salvation. He is the only way to the blessings of salvation, forgiveness, righteousness, eternal life, which includes being a part of God's family. Now, speaking of God's blessing, the blessings of this new covenant, the blessings that are guaranteed by it, are different from those that are guaranteed by the old covenant. At least they are right now in this age. That's because our greatest needs right now, as a result of breaking God's law, His commandments, as a result of breaking the old covenant, our greatest needs now are not physical, material, earthly, or temporal. Our greatest, our most pressing needs are spiritual and eternal things. We need salvation, and not primarily from earthly oppressors. We need forgiveness. We need righteousness. We need life. Because we are oppressed by Satan and by our own sin. Because we are enemies of God. Because we are sinners. Because we are unrighteous and therefore not right with God. Because we are dead in our sins and trespasses. The curse that we are under extends beyond the physical and it extends beyond this life. Jesus in His first coming and the kingdom that He brought with Him has dealt with and reversed all of that. We receive these benefits. We receive these blessings when we realize there is nothing that we can do to deserve them, but that Jesus has earned them and He provides them as we believe on Him, the promise, and as we believe on the promises that He, the promise, makes. We are blessed through Him. Even when we pray and receive answers to our prayers, it's through His name. That means it's based on His work and His worth and His person. To think that we can do something under the conditions of the Old Covenant to guarantee Old Covenant blessings is to do two terrible things. First, it is to belittle 
what Jesus has done. It is to make light of the necessity and the sufficiency and the exclusivity of His work. It is to suggest that what He has done is lacking and that there is some blessing that we don't need Him for. It is living as if He didn't come, as if He didn't live a perfect life, as if He didn't die a sacrificial death, as if He didn't rise in a victorious resurrection. And then second, to think that we can do something under the Old Covenant conditions to guarantee Old Covenant blessings is to minimize the blessings that He's already given to us. And this reveals that people like this really don't understand how awful their sin is and how great God's salvation is. And it reveals about these people what they really want from Jesus is things that are valued even by the people of the world. So, what are the blessings that we have already been given? What are we guaranteed now under the new covenant? Jesus came preaching about that very thing in the Sermon on the Mount. At the very beginning of it, even, in the portion that we call the Beatitudes, we find it in Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 3, where Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Did you hear who is blessed according to Jesus? Not those who do. Not those who don't do. Not those who earn. Not those who feel like they can live in such a way as to obligate God. No, those who are blessed are those who realize that they can't do. Who realize that they can't earn the poor in spirit, the humble, the spiritual beggar, those who mourn over their sins, the meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness that they cannot provide for themselves, those who seek God for mercy and purity of heart. Did you hear what the blessings are? Being a part of God's kingdom, which is salvation, being a child of God, the comfort of being forgiven, receiving mercy, seeing God, the promise of a future inheritance or the promise of reward in heaven. Now Paul wrote about new covenant blessings in Ephesians chapter 1. And there I'm going to begin to read in verse 3. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning to read in verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the promise of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will, according to His purpose which He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in Him, things in heaven, and things on earth. 
In Him we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of His glory. In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. Once more I ask you, as I did with the Beatitudes, did you hear who is blessed? Those in Christ, not those in their own righteousness. Did you hear what the blessings are? Spiritual blessings. Election. Predestination. Justification, adoption, grace, redemption, forgiveness, the truth, the gospel, knowledge, a future inheritance, and the Holy Spirit who Himself is the guarantee of that future inheritance. Did you notice what was absent from both of those texts on the blessings that are guaranteed at this time by the new covenant? The physical and material blessings of the Old Covenant. The very ones that so many people say we are guaranteed when it comes to the coronavirus. I hear Isaiah 53, 5 quoted often, you know it, by His stripes or by His wounds we are healed. But what kind of healing was Isaiah talking about? The kind of healing he talked about in the first part of that verse, which says... He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon Him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And by His wounds we are healed of our transgressions, of our iniquities, of our sins, of this spiritual problem that characterizes us all This spiritual problem being what has led to all the physical problems in the world. This is how the Passover verse in Exodus 12, 13 applies to us. The plague is the coming final judgment of God and eternity in hell. The Passover lamb is Jesus who was sacrificed on the cross. We apply His blood not physically to the doors of our home, but by faith in Him. And the final judgment of God then passes over us. We are spared from it or saved from it. Now as for physical healing, material blessing, earthly prosperity and peace, the elimination of tribulation and trials, as for the blessings of the old covenant, The work of Jesus does guarantee us those things. Later, when He comes again, not this age, but in the age to come. We read about it in the next to the last chapter of the Bible, Revelation 21, verse 1, which says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be His people. And God Himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, neither shall there be any of the things that lead to death, mourning, crying, pain, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Now when will this happen? Now? No. At the second coming of Christ, it will happen when we all get to heaven. 
In this age, we are never guaranteed protection from problems, healing from sickness, or deliverance from tribulation and trouble. In fact, it's just the opposite. We are guaranteed that these things will happen to us. Jesus said in John 16, 33, In this world, you will have tribulation. 2 Timothy 3 says the last days will be times of difficulty, and we've been living in the last days since the resurrection of Christ. 1 Peter 2.21 says, We have been called to suffering. Philippians 1.29 says, We have been given faith and suffering. James 1 verses 2 through 4 says, Various kinds of trials are a part of God's plan for us. Romans 5.3 says, We are to rejoice in suffering because of what God produces through it. And the book of Hebrews says, It is appointed for every one of us to die. So, we aren't guaranteed protection and or deliverance from these things, including the coronavirus. But we are guaranteed something that is of even greater comfort and even greater significance. I'll tell you what it is. That these things will not separate us from God's love in Christ. That these things will not separate us from salvation. Romans chapter 8 asks, Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword separate us from God? And then it answers, No, we are more than conquerors in all these things. Neither death, nor life, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. I ask you, what comfort would it be to know that these things can't separate us from the Lord if we were always to be spared or delivered from these things. It would be no comfort at all. It's a comfort because we're going to experience these things, because we have experienced these things, because we do experience these things, and because we will. In verse 36 of Romans 8, Paul wrote, he quoted from the Old Testament, For your sake, God, we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Jesus wasn't spared from the cross, though we prayed that he would be. He suffered and died. The apostles all suffered and died as martyrs. Read about Paul's sufferings throughout his life and ministry. The early church was not protected and delivered from suffering or sickness or anything else. Read the book of Acts. Read the book of Revelation. Christians down through the years have died in plagues and disasters, poverty and persecution. Read church history. Christians around the world today are struggling and they are hurting and they are suffering and they are dying even from the coronavirus. There is no guaranteed way to avoid it or get out of it, any of it. The Bible does not guarantee us protection and deliverance from the coronavirus. That's my answer. That's not to say that God can't protect us and deliver us. He can God can do anything He wants to, and He does everything that He wants to do. It's not to say that God won't protect and deliver us. He might. He has done things like that in the past for His people. He's done things like that for even some of us in the past. Sometimes He does protect and deliver. It's not to say that we shouldn't pray for it. We certainly can, and therefore we certainly should. It's not to say that our prayers don't make a difference. They do. They always do in us. And sometimes they do with God, at least in the sense of Him doing what we ask Him to do. But if God does anything, if God answers our prayers, if God blesses us, it's not because of what we do. It's because of what Christ has done. 
even our committed lives, and even our sincere and persistent and united prayers are not a guarantee that God will remove this or any other trial. And those New Testament texts that seem to suggest otherwise must be interpreted in light of everything else that the Bible says, including what it says about the mysterious things of God and the mysterious ways of God, and the mysterious mind of God, and the mysterious will of God. You might ask then, what hope do we have in this or other difficulties? And I would tell you, the hope that is built on Jesus' blood and righteousness A hope that guarantees that in Christ we are forgiven, that we are righteous, that we have eternal life, that we're a part of God's family. We have the hope that we've already talked about from Romans 8, that this or other trials cannot separate us from Christ. We have the hope that Christians have always had, that Christ has overcome the world that Christ will never leave us or forsake us, that Christ has given us His Spirit to comfort us and counsel us and encourage us and to empower us to persevere and to guarantee us a humongous eternal inheritance. We have the hope that Christ enables us to do in all circumstances. We have the hope that Christ is coming again to make all things new. We have the hope that Christ will raise us and glorify us. We have the hope that we'll soon be done with troubles and trials. We have the hope that the eternal weight of glory will make our present struggles seem as nothing. We have the hope that God will accomplish His plan and His work in and through us. We have the hope that God is in control and absolutely nothing can stop all His will from being accomplished. We have the hope that while we cannot see all of this with our eyes, we can see it afar by faith. We have the hope that one day our faith, our hope, will be sight. And until that day, Until Jesus comes, we continue in the faith and we continue in the work. We trust and we obey. So while the Bible doesn't guarantee us protection and or deliverance from the coronavirus right now, it does guarantee us future victory over it and over every other consequence of life in a sinful, fallen world world. It makes us this guarantee in Christ when He comes again, if we are in Him. Are you in Christ? Does His work count for you? Does His life and His death and His resurrection count for you? Have you received His forgiveness, His righteousness, His life? There's only one way to do so. Repent, turn, and believe. Trust on who He is as Lord and Savior and what He's done. If you will, He will save you and protect and deliver you eternally. The Bible guarantees it. Let's pray. We thank you, Father, for the guarantee of your word and the guarantees of this new covenant. And I pray that you would help us to rejoice in every one, every blessing that we have now and every blessing that we have to look forward to in the future. Until Christ comes, I pray that we would remain in the faith and committed to the work. In Jesus' name, I ask it. Amen.